Well, welcome to another edition of Orthopod. I'm Obindari, Editor-in-Chief of Ortho Evidence, and I get the pleasure uh, to chat with a friend and colleague, Dr. P.J. Devereaux, who is a professor and a director of the Division of Perioperative Medicine at McMaster University, among many other accolades. P.J., welcome. Hello. Huge thanks for having me here. Uh, very nice to be with you, and uh, yeah, thanks so much. Okay, so you have some breaking news. Now, it's it's at, o at Ortho Evidence, we're, we're breaking it maybe a a few days after the big news, but tell us a little bit about um, the news. So the news relates to the POISE 3 trial, which we just presented at the American College of Cardiology late-breaking trial session and simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, this was a randomized control trial of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery randomized to tranexamic acid or placebo. There was 9,535 patients, 114 centers, 22 countries. There's also a factorial, which I won't be talking about, which was a blood pressure management arm, but I'm going to focus on the tranexamic acid, and I think this has a lot of implications for the orthopedic world. Let me just take a step back. For many of our listeners, the idea of a late-breaking trial session, what does it take, first of all, for a trial to get into that session, and what are the implications usually of trials that make it into these very large sessions? Because in the orthopedic community, we don't usually have late-breaking uh, sessions as part of our big meetings. Yeah, so in cardiology, we're lucky that there tends to be a lot of big trials done. There's a lot of industry in that area, so there's lots of big trials being done all the time. So basically, it's only big trials that get into the late-breaking trial session. Um, they tend to get a lot of attention. They tend to, a lot, most of them have simultaneous publications in the top journals, and they tend to be trials that will influence clinical care. So if you're lucky enough, you pay enough money, I guess, uh, you can get your get your foot in the door. But uh, obviously, it's a great privilege, and we're really appreciative that we got that opportunity. Right. And this was a simultaneous publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Correct. Right. So, so do you want to speak a little bit then uh, uh, to the results and what you feel the implications of these results are? Now, the issue for, for those listening in and watching us is, you know, it's bleeding. It's bleeding uh, in surgery and non-cardiac surgery specifically. Within orthopedics, there's no shortage of interest and focus around bleeding outcomes, especially in, you know, in, in, in a host of, you know, whether it's arthroplasty, spine, uh, trauma procedures, all those types of patients would have been eligible for the study? Yeah. So anyone age 45 or greater having an in-hospital non-cardiac surgery right. um, who was deemed to have some risk of both bleeding and a vascular event were included. So very large population of patients were eligible for this trial. Um, we ended up having just over 2,000 orthopedic patients. Now, one of our exclusion criteria was if there was a planned uh, usage of systemic tranexamic acid, the patient would be excluded. Now, globally, there's still a lot of places in the world where people, even in orthopedics, are not using tranexamic acid. In North America, certainly a lot of people are. Probably the majority of orthopedic surgeons are using tranexamic acid, but they may not use it in all their cases. And there's some important information about orthopedics and which cases you may want to think about that I can come back to in the results. Um, but in a global context, there's a lot of patients having orthopedic surgery that are not getting it. When you go to the other non-cardiac, non-orthopedic surgeries, very few people get tranexamic acid. It's, it's uncommon in those groups. So we were testing whether or not, in fact, we can use it in the setting. We can safely prevent really important, clinically important bleeding. And would that be safe? Because obviously people have concern that if this is an antifibrinolytic drug, will we end up causing thrombotic events on the other side of the equation? So we were looking at both of those things in this trial. So our primary, we had two primary endpoints, was a primary efficacy endpoint, which was a composite of life-threatening major and critical organ bleeding. And then we had a primary safety endpoint, which was basically looking at the thrombotic side of the equation, whether or not people had myocardial injury, whether or not they had venous thromboembolism, whether or not they had peripheral arterial thrombosis or vascular death. Got it. Okay. And, and you identified, I mean, based on the paper, you know, it de definitely showed there was a, a positive signal related to bleeding outcomes, yeah. but there was an issue around non-inferiority safety outcomes. Maybe you can explain yeah. that. Yeah. So to start with, um, unequivocal benefit in terms of preventing bleeding, the, the signal is very clear. So um, we ended up having 9.1% of the people in the tranexamic acid group that had either life-threatening major or critical organ bleeding, whereas it was 127 in the placebo group. So an absolute difference of 2.7%, p-value less than 0. 0.00004, 25%, you know, relative risk reduction. And it was consistent across all forms of bleeding that we looked at. So when we looked at, um, we had developed 
you know, an issue that exists around even bleeding is there's all kinds of different definitions of bleeding that exist. So when we look at the ISTH bleeding, all different forms of bleeding, they were all reduced. But importantly, we did work prior to this where we developed um, empirically a definition of bleeding that was independently associated with death at 30 days. So bleeding independently associated with death, that was decreased by 25%. And importantly, we also demonstrated that transfusion, any patient getting transfusion decreased by 25%. Transfusions of two or more units decreased by 25%. Transfusions of two to four units decreased by 25%. So consistently across the board, we saw unequivocal benefits in terms of preventing bleeding. Um, now, on the safety side of it, so an issue that exists with non-inferiority is that you have to set a non-inferiority boundary. And what you're basically saying is, we're going to accept that if the upper bound of our or one-sided 97.5% confidence limit is below that limit, then we're going to say this you know, is clearly safe and there's no reason for concern. We set... Um, that threshold at a hazard ratio of 1.125. Now, if you compare it to the perioperative, um, you know, research that has looked at VTE, yep. oftentimes, you know, they have had hazard ratios over two. Um, so they've had weight. So we were setting a very, very low one. Very conservative on this one. Very low conservative. Okay. And um, in the trial, we ended up having a lot of, of these, you know, vascular events. So we ended up having 649 in the tranexamic acid group and 639 yeah. in the placebo group. So just under 1,300 events and an absolute difference of only 10 events. Now, the hazard ratio is 1.02. So most times if you and I do a trial, hazard ratio is 1.02, oh we say, yes. okay, forget it. There's no effect here. No effect. However, um, and this shows you the challenge when you set very you know, low non-inferiority margins, it did surpass the so our upper 90 or 97.5 percent complement just surpassed our 1.25 which okay. was our threshold that being 1.4 however when we take a bayesian approach to this there's a 96 percent probability that the hazard ratio is less than 1.125 yeah. and importantly what we advocate to people is non-inferiority margins in the end there is subjectivity to it now we can get into discussing why we chose what we did. And in yeah. fact, like any trial, whenever you finish it, you you then reflect and think, okay, I do this different. But yeah. even if you ignore all that, there is subjectivity. So what we'd say to people is, this is what you should walk away thinking about. There's an unequivocal 2.7% absolute reduction in bleeding, transfusions, all these things. Unequivocal. Yes. Highly statistically significant. Yeah. There was an absolute difference of only 0.3% in vascular events, a result that was not statistically at all but even if you assumed it really was 0.3%, you're offsetting that by 2.7% risk of serious bleeding and the need for transfusions. Also, too, when you put this in a context, especially in a global context, so worldwide, we're short 30 million blood products a year. And if you look at where you know who consumes blood products, right. surgery consumes 40% of all the blood products we use in a global context. So when you say that to yourself, you say, okay, look, given how much surgery happens in the non-cardiac surgery setting, we're decreasing this by 25% and it makes up 40% of the actual transfusions that we're using. Basically what, you know, POISE 3 says is that if we started to use tranexamic acid as a standard of care in people having non-cardiac surgery age 45 or greater, we would prevent 8 million transfusions a year, which would go a long way to dealing with the global shortage. We'll have an economic paper coming out on this, but I can tell you because we finished the analyses yeah. that this is actually on the cost effective side of things because blood is far from cheap from collecting it, processing it, getting it to a hospital and delivering it to someone relative that transamic acid is actually a very cheap drug. It's been around forever. So even if you gave it to everyone, it would actually be cost effective in terms of doing this and it would go a big way to dealing with the global shortage of blood products that we have. So even though we didn't truly demonstrate non-inferiority, the probability of non-inferiority is 96%. Yeah. And even if you took the worst case scenario and assumed that our 0.3 absolute difference in vascular events was real, it's completely offset by a 2.7% absolute benefit in terms of preventing life-threatening major and critical organ disease. Yeah. Shoku is like a very compelling rationale to be thinking about its use. Now, because it was about around 20% would have been orthopedic patients. And to our orthopedic community, yeah. 
they're probably going to be thinking, okay, so we can apply this to, to our patients or to whom do, would this ideally apply? Maybe you can yeah. give some insight on that. Yeah, so importantly, in the main paper, there'll be a separate paper that comes out on this, but okay. in the main paper, we did report an a priori subgroup, which was orthopedic versus other yep. non-cardiac surgeries. And we were mainly looking at that because we already realized that certainly in, in North America, a lot of the orthopedic community is already on side yeah. with transplant. Yeah. They may not be on it for all patients, but in general, they've bought into transplant. We wanted to make sure that we were going to convince the other non-cardiac surgery group that, hey, this works in your patient population. The It showed that it was equally effective in both. But importantly, the result is already statistically significant in the orthopedic group. So even with 2,000 patients, we had this statistically significant result. Now, oh, another thing, okay. so another thing just to highlight, the reason why we ended up choosing such an extremely low number is that, you know, you and I have discussed this before. I actually think the vast majority of trials that we're doing, they're way underpowered. We shouldn't yes. be aiming for 80, 85, or even 90% power. We should be aiming for 99% power. And the reason I say that is, when we publish a trial like POISE-3 and everyone yeah. sees, okay, the p-value is less than 0. 0.00001, yeah. everyone says, okay, clearly that works. So you want to be in a situation where there's no, a lot of events, there's zero ambiguity. The reason why we set it so low is, is that we only, most people will never do non-inferiority. Like when most people are doing a trial versus placebo, yeah. people don't test for non-inferiority no. because they just say, hey, if there's, a, if there's no signal on the safety side, they just assume there's no signal. Right. We use it to our advantage to say, if I did a trial and say, I'm just going to go to CHR and say, I want funding to prove I'm going to prevent bleeding, yeah. they would have funded me probably for 3,000 patients. I wanted to be up around 10,000 patients. So even when we get into all the subgroups, there'd be no ambiguity about the benefit. Yeah. The only way we could do that is say, okay, we're also going to test for non-inferiority. And as soon as you start numbers. testing for non-inferiority and you put down that margin, you crank up the sample size. So, you know... Again, I, I do think that we're overall doing a disservice. Our trial should be much bigger in, this, in the range of what we had on the efficacy side with the yeah. POIS-3 so that there's zero ambiguity about effect. Um, but you end up being stuck with, okay, we had to do that by declaring a really low non-inferiority, but I just ask people to use rational sense. Oh, I mean, Here's the result, you know, take, make your own choice. What would you choose for your loved one? Oh, right. I mean, like, if, if you look at the safety signal in terms of potential, like, safety complications, 14.2% versus 13.9%. It is 0.3% difference yeah. to, you know, to most individuals pragmatically looking at that. They're going to say, with 10,000 patients, they say, now, I'm, I'm betting there's no difference here. And when you see the opposite happening on the bleeding, there's a dramatic difference. Right. You know, it does make it fairly compelling. Yeah. So, what, go ahead. Okay. So, now specifically to yeah. your orthopedic subpopulation, what I've seen a number of, you know, orthopedic surgeons would say to me is that, you know, in general I use it, but I'll tend maybe not to use it if I think it's someone who starts off with a normal looking hemoglobin and maybe they're not that old because I think they're going to be fine, low yeah. risk of bleeding. And two things are relevant. We show we did a subgroup that was a priori defined based upon your preoperative hemoglobin. It worked equally well in people that had the hemoglobin greater than 120 to start. In fact, the result is statistically significant for that subgroup versus your hemoglobin was less than 120 to start. In fact, the treatment effect was higher when, in fact, it's not the interaction term is not statistically significant. However, the point estimate is it's close, like the interaction p by is 0.06, uh, to almost suggesting that there is an interaction that if your hemoglobin prior to surgery is high, you stand to benefit more from transdermic acid than it's low. Now, I think really what that is really telling you about is that it's not that you don't benefit if your hemoglobin is low to start. Yeah. It's just that the probability of getting transfused is already so high and people are already have a low threshold for transfusing you that you start to get noise in the signal because people are just going to transfuse yeah, 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 because yeah. they're nervous because you're already starting off low. And I think, in fact, the baseline hemoglobin starting at greater than 120 is actually really telling you what the real signal is. It's probably actually closer to, it's probably just over a 30% relative risk reduction in the real effect when you're getting rid of the noise signal that happens when you start with the low hemoglobin. So the thing I would, I would advocate to the orthopedic group is that, you know, a lot of times you're thinking, hey, it's just a younger patient or it's a patient who's starting with a good hemoglobin. I don't need to be worried about transdermic acid. The data suggests, in fact, those patients actually differentially even benefit more. Um, and the thing that none of us can obviously predict is that sometimes things are just going to happen. So yeah. it may start off as with your thought, this is a lower risk patient. But the reality is when you look at the placebo group, all comers having non-cardiac surgery, 
12.7% had life-threatening, major, or critical organ bleeding. That's a high proportion of patients. Things will just happen. So I think when you think about the cost and, and you look at the overall safety of the drug, right. you have to say to yourself, you know, if it was your loved one, even if, you know, it may not bleed, given that the reality is there's still a high proportion that do bleed and you can't predict everything up front, why wouldn't you give the drug to everyone? Fascinating. And I think, you know, I think you'd make a pretty compelling argument. The one question I have, and maybe we'll close out with this one, PJ, is, you know, you, you've had a very successful program with the POIS trials. And I would ur urge um, anyone listening in to take a look at the POIS trials the program. This is three. Usually, um, you know, your work has led you to continue future questions in this area. Where do you think you're going to be going with the, you know, with the future in terms of the research you're doing based on some of the work you've already done in POIS? Yeah, so I think for certain we're, there's lots more trials to come, but I think where we're spending the majority of our time now is using remote automated monitoring technologies after surgery. Because, you know, the remarkable thing that we've shown in some of our other research stuff that you were involved yeah. with with vision is that even though most people are anxiously waiting in a recovery room for you surgeons to come tell them their loved ones survive, surgery disproportionately is now the safest period of the perioperative setting when it should actually be the highest risk. So you have to ask yourself, why is it the safest when it should be the highest risk? Yeah. And it's because there's very good monitoring and there's physicians that are there available watching the patient. And the reality is, and this is not going to change just because of the cost implication, the nursing to patient ratio on surgical floors, including orthopedic, has great limitations. So they're only measuring their vitals every six, eight, not uncommon every 12 yeah. hours. They're on narcotics, they're post anesthetic, yeah. don't have normal alert mechanisms. So I think if we can move and get really good continuous non-invasive monitoring of our patients after surgery, never have nurses measure vitals again, technology measured, simply alert the nurse to go see Mrs. Smith. And so, you know, the next series of trials will be people being randomized to get this type of technology with early alert, you know, mechanisms to say, hey, Mrs. Smith has a pattern where she's going in the wrong direction um, versus just normal care. Um, but there's also many other drugs. There's some things we're in talks with some companies right now. So. There'll be lots of drug trials coming in that too. I take it your days are filled. <laughs> Our days are filled. Thanks so much for having us. Really awesome. appreciate it. Thanks so much.